Hi there. Uh, welcome to Down the Middle. This particular episode is going to appeal to the younger viewers out there on YouTube. We are going to break the demographics of this show. I'm so pleased to, to be bringing to you today very young, accomplished, successful people in my field. Eric Basmajan is a founder of EBP Macro Research. And we've also got with us Vance Bars, founder and wealth strategist at Your Dedicated Fiduciary. He helps people think outside the box when it comes to how to run their money, and that's that's hard to find these days. So, gentlemen, thank you both for being here today. This is this a this is my first like two at once, but I had to add you up to get to my age. So, um, but thank you for being here <laughs> and this sunny, beautiful afternoon in Manhattan. This is just fabulous. I'm excited for this talk. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's it's quite an honor to be here. I can't tell you how long I've listen to your Fed commentary and you've done some of the most legendary interviews in economics that I've ever seen. So it's quite an honor to be able to speak wow. with you and to be here with Vance. Okay, cut. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Vance, we met on Twitter. We did. You're the first person I've ever met on Twitter who have actually wanted to meet in person after meeting them on Twitter as opposed to blocking and muting them. <laughs> That's right. 1996 me was like, don't go on the internet. Uh, you know, 2016 me is like, let's make friends. Yeah. And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It worked. Here. You come to the Christmas party. You're married yeah. to a great woman. Um, Two great kids, so. And Eric, you're recently engaged. Can I say that out loud? Yes, you can. Congratulations. Thank and you, you know every much. single steakhouse in Manhattan, so we can, <laughs> yeah, right. we can talk a whole hour about that. Um, but rather than do that, uh, Vance, I'm gonna start with you. You, uh, you became a little disenfranchised, shall we say, with the way that people had been increasingly trained post March 2009 uh, to run money and that caused you to break out on your own. So what is your philosophy and what do people need to know about the advice they're getting these days and what they should be on the lookout for at, oh, I don't know, economic inflection points? <laughs> I spent a decade traveling the country full time consulting leading wealth managers at wirehouses, independent broker dealers, REAs, and of course, family offices. Mm -hmm. And I learned way more than I ever bargained for in that role. And very specifically, I was going in to meet with the investment committee for these firms to consult them on how to use institutional money managers. And I started in this business with Altegris Investments, which mm -hmm. had really a brilliant idea, in my opinion. If you could go to names like SAC, John Paulson, Citadel, Winton, Brevin Howard, Third Point and others, mm -hmm. you could. But if you didn't have the minimums, you could go through us. So we were a platform of feeder funds. And I remember back in 2007, sitting at this happy hour spot in La Jolla and watching all of these very nice cars come up and these guys get out and they have the great big brightening watches. Oh yeah. And I, I've never met a stranger, so I walk up to them and I go, what is it that you guys do? Yeah, I'm just gonna say it out loud, stranger danger with you. Okay, keep going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they go. <laughs> We're loan originators. I go, oh, like, like mortgage brokers. Well, yeah. I go, okay. Uh, well, that's great. And I said, well, don't you own a house? I go, no. I think I had 15,000 bucks saved up at the time. And they go, you dumb, dumb. <laughs> you got the opportunity to put zero money down. And in three or five years, you'll be making more money. Just go buy a house. And I go, yeah, but what if I'm not making more money? Because the, the, the core rate, then, the Fed funds rate, was a five handle. Yeah. So let's do the math on that. I would have to have at least- uh, God, back in the good old days. <laughs> right, right. And I went, what happens if I'm not? And they go, well, no problem, just turn around and sell the house. And I went, how many of these are you guys doing? Oh, this is all we do. And I thought, this is interesting. And I did not predict 2008. I did not see that coming. I figured that the economy might be a bug in search of a windshield. Uh, and the rest of us know that story. But in that 10 year period, Danielle, I got a lot of exposure in going into these different so-called wealth management offices and learning what they offer clients, what they don't offer clients, mm -hmm. and how many of them manage money per the consensus. Right. And it was so fascinating to me because in 2007, when I was calling on these offices saying, hey, we offer this platform of strategies that historically have hedged against downside market volatility, no one cared. No. There were, there were mm -hmm. advisors many of whom were well-known, that said, take me off your list. Don't bother me again. Yeah. Fast forward to 
April, May, June of 2009, many of those same people were calling me going, hey, we'd like you to come in and meet with some of our clients and uh, go ahead and you know, do the dog and pony show. Yep. You know, bring some polar fleeces and some golf balls. And it gave me a really unusual insight into not only how these firms operate, the different conflicts of interest that they have, mm -hmm. how they manage money, the products that they use, are they proprietary in nature? That's a big one. But it also oh, yeah. gave me insight into uh, the decision processes that are employed by the investment committees. And I did that for about a decade. And a few life events happened. And I decided to set out on my own. And you know, one thing I've learned over the years is that life is what happens to us while we're implementing our plans. But to the point, in 2009, we entered into what I believe was a paradigm shift in mm -hmm. investing. And that paradigm shift was the transition into QE-driven, momentum-driven, passive investment driven, you know, the, the whole ZERP world, the TINA, all these acronyms that we hear. Yep. And few of us knew that at the time because we thought, well, the Fed is doing what's believed to be in the best interest of the public. Mm -hmm. And here we are today. And so we have this momentum driven world. And I don't know, is active still alive? <laughs> if it is, it's, it's still quickly dying. Let's put it that way. Now, you at the time were at NYU, I, I want to say, yes. when the world was ending. I was a little bit, I was, a little, I was still a, in my tail end of my high school career, but uh, I was going oh boy. to NYU. Did I mention a younger demographic? Okay, here we are. Keep going. Yeah, so the, the, the way that it happened for me was I was, I was at NYU studying economics, mm -hmm. and I took a course called Financial Crises, which was a history of all the financial crises. And it resonated with me very deeply because um, there were a couple of things. One is that they happened with a regularity that all of us in our lifetime were going to experience at least a couple of these things, right? Well, you, you, me, but not Janet Yellen. Yeah, yes. that's right. And, and then the other thing is that when they did happen, it was all that mattered, right? So for example, you could be sitting there in 2007 in one of these wealth management offices or at, at a, a uh, bottoms up shop and you could have done the best bottoms up analysis on Coke versus Pepsi. Mm -hmm. But it really didn't matter when, when a financial crisis happened, right? right? So it, it didn't make sense to me to have an investment framework that didn't have some element of understanding the, the symptoms or buildups or causes of these events. Mm -hmm. So all of these financial crises had some element of um, excesses in, in debt, right? So that set off uh, sort of an obsession in understanding these debt dynamics and debt deflation and demographics, the two factors that I feel are most important to, to understanding these long-term trends. Mm -hmm. So I started to read everything that there was uh, on the subject, which brought me to, to one of what I think is your greatest interviews, which was, was Dr. Lacey Hunt, who's probably the best on this subject that we have. He is a legend. Um, and uh, fast forward, I graduated and I actually uh, was able to jump straight to the buy side and I worked at a quant shop, mm -hmm. which was not in the macro space, but I learned a lot of programming and some good stuff there. Uh, and it also gave me some sensitivities to the short term nature of portfolio managers, right? So you can have a great, <laughs> you can have a great long term thesis and try and understand these financial crises that may happen every 10 years, but everyone's worried about what's going to happen this quarter, right? Yeah. So, so I knew that there was that you had to bridge the gap between the, the long term secular trends that may contribute to excesses and more short term uh, focused research, mm -hmm. which led me to studying business cycle experts like uh, the, uh, Jeffrey Moore. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey Moore had uh, a concept called these growth rate cycles. So these cycles and growth that happen within a business cycle, right? So from 2009 until 2020 when we had COVID, that was one long business cycle expansion. But you know as well as anyone, Danielle, we had a, a crisis in 2012 in mm -hmm. Europe, yep. then we had a, a cyclical upturn. We had oil fell to $20 a barrel in yep. 2016. Industrial we, recession. Exa yep. Exactly, we, it was a quasi-recession, some people called it, right? Then we had a, another big upturn, and then we had the trade war slow down, right? All of these were independent cyclical events, so I thought, yep. Wow, there's a lot of really prime research to be done on these growth rate cycles, 
and having and, and, and at this fund, you'll know as well as anyone, Danielle, that the consensus Wall Street research only goes one way, right? And there are these 18 month cycles, two year cycles that are turning all the time. Some right. of them end in recession, some of them don't. So I thought, and I looked out there, and I didn't think that there was really anyone that was putting together these secular trends and these cyclical trends. And I thought that there was a great opportunity to, to provide some research there. So that's sort of how I got started doing what I'm doing. So um, both of you have really <clears throat> employed social media to your benefit. Vance, are, are you just Twitter? Are you other platforms? I think you're LinkedIn. How has that, um, how, how has that affected your career trajectory since, call it, the first decade versus since then? So I'm a little older than I look, and social media to me is sort of um, an arbitrary forced thing, right? I was strongly encouraged to join Twitter, uh, rewind back to when I founded my firm, mm -hmm. seven years ago today, by the way. Well, well. Congratulations. Enough, thanks. Yeah. You know, I think we made it, right? But Well, your socks certainly think so. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, <laughs> I called the chief marketing officer that I had worked with, who mm -hmm. was an absolutely wonderful soul, and I asked her, how do I get my message out? You know, I have this knowledge up here about what many of the family office, RAA, wirehouse teams don't do, particularly with respect to advanced planning. Mm -hmm. How do we keep as much money in the estate as possible? How do we foster familial unity? Things like family heritage statements. People go, what is that? Yeah. Like the things that ultimately matter most to humans. And I want to take what's up here from my experience in consulting financial advisors on how to invest for high net worth and ultra high net worth families and convey that message in a meaningful way. And she said, you have to hire Mark Rose of FinSquared, which I did, which was a game changer for me for two reasons. One, I got a website out of the deal. <laughs> and two, he goes- Websites are tricky. They are, they are, and they can be time consuming as well. And two, he said, you have to get on this FinTwit thing. I'm like, I'm on Twitter, or excuse me, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. The last thing I need is another time drain and social yeah. media platform. And he goes, no, I don't think you understand. You have to join Twitter because um, that's where all of the financial journalists you know, hang out and share ideas and so on and so forth. Yeah. And he, it was so interesting. The day after we had sold our beach place and moved inland in San Diego, he calls me and he said, I have Jeff Benjamin of Investment News. He's ready to talk to you about alternative investments. And I went, great, when? He goes, right now. I'm like, I'm on four and a half hours of sleep. I got boxes <laughs> stacked up. There's no way. And he goes, when Jeff Benjamin of Investment News is ready to talk, you talk. You talk. And we got on the phone and I was exhausted. And it was a very, to my fault, awkward conversation. And it was a pretty brief seven to eight minute conversation. And I couldn't talk about some of the, the product related questions that a lot of financial journalists naturally ask about because the compliance alligators will start chomping at the tail feather, right? Yep. Count your blessings not being part, anyway. Um, in any event, so I had heard through the rumor mill that Jeff Benjamin was going to be attending the Schwab conference in San Diego. Knowing that he was in the Marines, once a Marine, always a Marine, and thank you, Jeff, and everyone for your service. My grandfather, who was a Marine, made a figurine that I have at my desk, and I brought that with me because Jeff agreed to give me a 10-minute coffee conversation at the Schwab conference. And we sat down, and I pulled it out of my briefcase, and I said, I just want you to know I really appreciate what you've done for this country. I am as patriotic as they come. And that 10 minute conversation evolved into a 90 minute interview where I spilled my heart to him on what I thought the public needs to know about the inner workings of not only the financial services industry, but also the areas, particularly the planning areas where so many wealth management firms and teams don't bring value. Mm -hmm. Looking at tax returns, how can you do what's in the best interest of the client without a deep understanding of the tax return? What about the estate planning? And I can yep. save that for later. But that relationship formed quickly, and Jeff Benjamin of Investment News is ultimately the one who introduced me to so many of the financial journalists, and that's why I'm active on Twitter. It's for the idea sharing and the value content creation for the public. So my takeaway here is, is your philosophy on nobody ever being a stranger. 
No one. I've never met a stranger. It doesn't matter if it's a bozo on the bus or a billionaire in a Bentley. Everyone's the same. This is wise, wise, wise guidance because people ask me all the time, what's the best thing to do with outset of your career? And my answer is always sales. You got to start off in sales in one shape or form because in life, no matter where you land and what you're doing, even if it's being a great macroeconomist, you're selling. You're selling constantly. Absolutely. So, so you were, you you have a do you have a unit platform? Because I mean, all I know of you is on Twitter. But then I'm yes. I've been told I need to find this thing called Instagram. I know I'm on it. I just anyways. So so Twitter is my my big platform. I mean, I have epbmacroresearch.com, but but my big presence of of gaining. Uh, uh, new followers or spreading my message is really is really through Twitter. That's the that's the best medium for me. And um, social media is is the best that the world has to offer and the worst that the mm. world has to offer, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's it's certainly you know if you ask me, it's one of my favorite places to be. But if you ask my fiance, it's terrible, right? Because I'm on it all the time. Um, so it's. It's become. I've a, heard that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an hour of trying, honey. trying to and, hide somewhere. And the kids, don't parent yeah. like this. Uh, right. Not a good move. In line at the grocery store, you gotta just make sure you get, yeah, you know what's going on. Um, but it's become a place that we all have to be, right? It's yeah. where all the eyeballs in the world are. I mean, you look at the big five companies. I think I read a, a study recently that the big five or six companies occupy over 90% of people's day-to-day -day time. You think about you're either on your phone, your computer, every single thing that you do of your waking hours, it's all controlled by five people, which are these social media platforms, basically. Yeah. So if you're looking for business growth, it's an essential place to be. You really mm -hmm. can't, you, know, you pick your platform, it's YouTube or, or, or Twitter or Instagram, but you have to be there because that's where the eyeballs are. And it's a delicate balance between trying to extract all the great parts of Twitter or social media in terms of leveraging a following, but also learning new information, and then trying to resist the temptation to be there all the time, which is something I think that we're all trying to work on every day. I think my eyeballs just rolled <laughs> yeah. back in my head again. But you know, the best Twitter advice I ever got was always provide a picture. And I think that's probably because Fintwit is dominated by men. I really just said that out <laughs> loud. Um, but that, that was some of the best advice I ever got was always show a graph. Right. Don't just throw the words out there right. unless they're like words of some central banker. Um, but always, <laughs> always share a graph. You've got great graphs. So t t tell me a little, because when I first saw your research, I'm like, this stuff is rich. I mean, it's, and you think completely outside the box. Do you think that's because you never went over to the dark sell side? I think that having the freedom to, to operate and just say what's on my mind at any time is a huge competitive advantage because mm -hmm. I speak to some people that are um, really limited in terms of what they say. They say, man, I would love to say X, Y, Z, but I'll never get that through my compliance officer. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's a horrible way to operate, right? Yeah. And, and if we're all trying to find the right answer here, it never made sense to me why some things would be off limits, right? Oh, sell side research is it's censored. Yeah, and that it goes back to the th uh, one of the comments I made earlier that it all seems to go one direction, right? You never, you can usually get away with anything that's going in a bullish or positive direction, but it's the bearish stuff that may may not go with with the consensus narrative, right? Well, so I recently had a conversation with Randy Forsyth, who at the beginning of his career he had like four years at Merrill Lynch back when we still had Mother Merrill with us. And it's funny because all these years later, you're saying what he said occurred in the 1970s, that you could never have a sell order for a stock, that neutral meant sell, and that everything else was pretty much buy. And it's just incredible that we've gone through all of these generations, and yet sell-side research really hasn't evolved to right. the benefit of the client. It's right. evolved, well, I mean, they make a lot of money, so it's evolved <laughs> yeah, to right. the benefit of them. But, but getting back to clients, I mean, how do you, how do you communicate to, to clients to look further out over the horizon in an environment in which people are so focused on, where did Bitcoin close? Well, I take that back. Bitcoin does not close. Sorry, big boo-boo. Um, <laughs> it's a 24-hour asset, ex right? Exactly. It's a 24-hour asset class. I, I don't think a lot of people, though, understand that. <laughs> you're, you're right. You know? 
But Someone it's yet another reason went, to be on Twitter on the right, weekend. Right, right. <laughs> Someone out there just went, oh, it's open 24-7? Great. The casino I'm never going to sleep. Open, right? yeah. I'm just going to hook myself up to coffee right now and never go to sleep. Hey, wait, the casino doesn't close at 4 on Friday? Exactly. The casino. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. But So how do you convey to people to calm down, step back, look out over the horizon, not try and be at that very precipice of the next hottest thing? When markets get volatile, mm -hmm. I get very few calls. And that's for two reasons. One, it's because most of the 50-ish families that are served by our firm have been through capital market cycles mm -hmm. and they understand. And secondarily, I tell them, I will proactively communicate with you when I'm worried, start worrying. And, and I mean that sincerely. I will let you know when things are very concerning to me, I will come to you with solutions because what's the point in just complaining about a problem or a potential problem mm -hmm. and in the meantime mrs jones until i actually am worrying go out and live your life run your business yeah. spend time with the grandkids spend time with your kids go live life to the fullest because that's what ultimately matters and i want people to understand that the goal is to live an enriched fulfilling life and my own life experiences have instilled that in me and I've just you know made it my raison d'etre if you will so um so the clients get to unplug but you don't <laughs> yes and you know let's go back to the COVID sell-off it was the fastest equity sell-off in history uh -huh. and there, since 1933 but yes yes carry the two yes that's right pop <laughs> quiz she knows her stuff yeah you'll never um, win on a pop quiz against the, Daniel. yeah yeah uh, not a competition <laughs> yeah but it was the fastest in recent memory and the fastest for, uh, you know, even the, the folks at our firm, the clients of our firm that are in their late seventies to mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And it happened so fast. Mm -hmm. And there were a handful of folks that called, not because they were worried about equities going to zero mm -hmm. or anything like that. They, they called to go, how are you doing? How is this impacting you as a human being? What yeah. are you doing to find Zen? And it was very touching when I got those calls. Mm. But when volatility shows its head, there's opportunity and we took action. What do you make of uh, the derision of 2021? Um, a lot of very successful investors were publicly derided for having large cash positions. And I mean, they were really taken to the woodshed. You know, this person's like, they clearly have, Pass their expiration date, take them out to pasture, blah, blah, and, and then things get bumpier and bumpier and bumpier, and all of a sudden, who's got money for opportunities and who doesn't? I need dry powder. Yeah, we live in up until, it might be a paradigm shift again right now, right? We've been in this QE driven, passive driven. Yeah. Um, let's look at 401k plans. What happens? You have to now opt out right? Mm -hmm. So you get thrown in the QDIA, you get thrown into the target date fund. It's passive, passive, passive. And in the ZERP driven world, in the QE driven, momentum driven, flow driven environment, active management, particularly when you look at some of the, the well-known hedge fund managers that have gone, I can't, yeah. right? Um, it, it's a pretty difficult environment. And there's much to be debated with respect to whether or not we might be at a paradigm shift now. If rates go up, you know, let's say we have inflation that's high, but it ends up going down to an above average level of inflation. Historically, when that's happened, that's been a windfall, if you will, for certain types of value equities. Mm -hmm. Look at the alligator jaws between growth and value oh, yeah. since QE started. Are they about to shut? I don't know, stay tuned for more. Time will tell. Well, let's ask a fundamental question, Eric. You know, does the Fed have the same optionality that, that Ben Bernanke had to, to launch QE, that, that Jay Powell had in 2018, 20, 2019 to launch not QE? Right. Is that optionality there? Yeah, well, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to make the same pivots of the past because obviously of this crazy high inflation rate that we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, one, one point that I want to you know, 
touch on that, that you were just saying is, uh, while the central banks have exerted a huge thumb on the scale, when we look at these growth rate cycles, we do find that asset prices are still very correlated to these growth rate cycles that happen. Mm -hmm. For example, but w w what is different is how long it takes assets to react and then how quickly they panic. But when we look at the 2015 into 16 slowdown, huge equity market correction. Yep. When we look in 2012, huge equity market correction. Mm -hmm. 2000, uh, 18, you know, the trade war slowdown, which in my opinion was not really related to the trade war. We had interest rate cuts, we had, you know, equity market correction. So we still do see asset prices following these growth rate cycles, although there has been a lot of distortion that's come in in, in various different places. So I just want to make the note that even though they're exerting a heavy hand on the situation, when we look at these growth rate cycles, they still do drive, in my opinion, the majority of the move. I don't mm -hmm. think that central banks have taken over into a, into a realm where nothing matters anymore. I think that the data suggests otherwise. But going to your question about the, about the potential pivot here, it's going to be incredibly difficult because we don't have the inflation numbers that incorporate these uh, Russia and Ukraine situation no. yet, which could put even further upward pressure on food prices and energy prices. So mm -hmm. we may not have seen the peak in year-over-year uh, -year CPI inflation yet, but what is interesting, Danielle, is that long-term inflation expectations, like five-year, five-year forwards, are reluctant to push to this new high. They're sort of still granting the Fed this credibility that if you guys really raise like you say you are, we may have a sharper economic slowdown and that right. may keep inflation expectations I mean, expectations I feel like we, you know, lower. on longer-term inflation expectations, I feel like there's a 3% ceiling. Exactly. You can't, you just can't get past it. And that has to do, I think, with these secular conditions that we were so, talking about I, earlier. So one of my biggest, one of my biggest struggles myself uh, with, with my own macroeconomic thesis is it's very difficult to square the visible slowdown because we had consumer confidence sour. This is prior to February 24th when, when Putin marched in, 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 right. into, into Ukraine. Oh, many indicators were already slowing yep. prior to and yet it's so hard to square that with what's going on in the labor market right now. What, what are your, do you see anything in the weeds that, that's telling you something different than the jolts data, which, which Lacey Hunt himself <laughs> finds to be somewhat questionable? Yeah, it's funny. I, I actually, uh, of all the data series that I look at, the jolts series is not one that's in my main uh, bucket of indicators. Um, I look at all economic data in, in rate of change terms or in, in geeky math terms and second derivative terms, sure. right? So what's... Yay, calculus! Yeah. Right? I love yeah. it. Yeah. So oh, is, is the growth rate accelerating or decelerating, right? right? And what we saw was we had this huge drop uh, in all economic data into COVID and then we had this rebound, right? And when we look at what I would call coincident economic indicators, what sort mm -hmm. of marks the economy, which would be employment, consumption, income, and industrial production, all four of those indicators peaked in growth rate terms in either March or April. So employment in growth rate terms actually peaked in April of 2020, 2021. 2021, right? At about 6% employment growth, and that's cooled to about 4%. So 4% is still a very high number, right. but in, in rate of change terms, it's, it's declining. And when we look at leading indicators of employment, uh, weekly manufacturing hours worked, they did increase in, in, in the last report, but it's been a sharp slowdown right. for the last six or seven months, which tends to foreshadow a continued drop in, uh, in the growth rate of, of that uh, employment. And the other thing that uh, I would mention is that um, as the inflation rate sticks higher, the real growth number will stick lower, right? This inflation doesn't create magical nominal growth. All this inflation will do is steal from real growth, right? So if, yep. if nominal is six and inflation comes in higher, that's just going to detract from real growth. And I think what a lot of people misunderstand is that real growth is more synonymous with um, like unit volume or production volume, right? right? So if we have this super high inflation number and the Atlanta Fed number for Q1 is basically at zero, and we have unit volumes that are falling close to zero, well, what does that mean? You need less production, you need less employment, and then that cycles back to less income. And then you get this, what we call a, a vicious economic cycle, 
where the old adverse feedback loop. exactly yeah. where where yeah. lower real income feeds to lower consumption, which feeds to lower employment, and then less production, and that cycle feeds on itself. The opposite of a virtuous economic cycle. So. Those, those examples are kind of how I square what, what is seemingly a, a, a quote-unquote tight labor market. The last point is that even though this is reportedly the tightest labor market we've ever seen in the history of whatever, we still can't generate positive real wage gains. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that doesn't square with the narrative, right? If the market was so tight and companies you know, couldn't find labor and they were willing to do anything, they're banging on doors to get labor, pay a wage rate above the rate of inflation. Right. But they can't do it. Either their margins are too compressed or it's not in their best interest to, to acquire new labor and expand output. So there are some discrepancies going on with this very tight labor market phenomenon. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna give, to give you a, a pop, quid, quid, pop quiz question, uh -oh. um, which is hard to say. <laughs> You're up. Yeah. <laughs> um, is the supply chain disruption over? Uh, well... I would say it's, it's, it's really difficult to answer that. I would say I don't know. Well, I mean, we've had, I mean, your, your average freighter in Los Angeles has gone from 13 and a half days to two days to get unloaded. Right. And your, your regional Fed surveys are suggesting, right, that right. The inventories are rising. Exactly. I would say it's, so. Because I mean, it's an impossible question to answer, by the way. Yeah, exactly. That is not fair. It was a trick question. I'm off the hook. It's fair. Uh, but if, if you, I wrote a note uh, before the Russia-Ukraine event. Mm -hmm. And there were, as you were suggesting, a significant amount of signals that were suggesting the peak in inflation may, may be in. Mm -hmm. right? We were seeing supplier delivery times come down, inventories were rising, as you said, inflation expectations were coming down. Um, uh, other leading indicators of inflation, like the producer price index, uh, core producer price index was starting to come, come down in growth rate terms. But then the Russia-Ukraine event happened, which threw a whole nother kink in the supply chain, which now makes it a little bit more unpredictable because now we'll have to wait for all this new data to come in to see what happened to, to the supply chain. I know uh, Empire Fed manufacturing for March was recently released, which showed supplier delivery times ticked up again. Yep. The, the business activity was terrible, but supplier delivery times continue to get extended. So I think we'll have to readdress the situation. I know uh, all of us who have tried to call the peak in inflation have been you know, slapped in the face a couple of times with these rolling supply chain disruptions. But uh, I would say that the signs were in, that, that it was starting to ease. I think we'll have to readdress once we get more information. So uh, former Down the Middle guest Dennis McGill, he adheres to both of your philosophies about the rate of change. So how, Vance, how, do, and, and his bottom line is that the growth rate of the population has been declining for years and that that's what matters most. We talked about that Demographics is destiny. Demographics, right? Demographics is destiny, it, right? Yes, it yeah. is. And it, it has slowed to the extent that the, the National Association of Realtors, the largest lobby in the country, hello, uh, th th their, their estimate that we need 6.8 million homes built is just ridiculous compared to maybe the 1 million deficit that is actually out there, according to Dennis McGill's math. And he, he's, he's really done the granular work that needs to be done. And so as, as hard as it is to conceive, we may be at an inflection point finally for the baby boomer generation. So how do you help plan a portfolio when we may be approaching this great shift out of equities and presumably into fixed income and what that regime change is going to, how that's going to affect how you plan because there are 75 million of them. 10,000 baby boomers are retiring a day in this country. <clears throat> it's a big number. It's a huge number, right? And on the demographics equals destiny mm -hmm. idea, to piggyback on that, in the working age population in high income earning developed nations and China has plateaued and is projected to go down over the next 25 years. So that shortage in workers, I would argue, might, and I emphasize might, mean additional uh, wages or higher wages can be demanded, um, ergo some level of inflation, right? You're the macroeconomist, uh, macroeconomist, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, but in any event, if we have that paradigm shift mm -hmm. and you know, we look at a 60-40 portfolio, how we, in the 60%, so in the stock portfolio, how we use different types of equities in different sectors 
can largely become much more important if we enter into an environment where we do have an above average level of inflation on the heels of the last 10 years. And what I was talking about earlier is it's not like the Fed has driven markets entirely for the last decade. But when we are in a rate where interest rates are at zero, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The Fed takes its balance sheet to nine trillion. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury have a shotgun wedding, which I dubbed Treasury on Twitter. <laughs> Good one. Right? Like, it's an environment that we have to understand context. We have an entire generation of investors right now today who have only known zero interest rate policy and balance sheet policy mm -hmm. for their their entire investing careers, whether they're in the professional world like us or mm -hmm. those self-directed investors. Mm -hmm. Fixed income becomes very important. What is the average effective duration of the bonds in that portfolio? What's the credit quality? And this is nothing new to you know, those of us who have been in the industry for some time, but it becomes really important because selection is key. So it sounds like uh, it sounds like dividends are going to become more important as a factor of time. My view is that tax returns should drive all prudent planning for someone because let's say you go to a medical specialist. What does that medical specialist almost always ask for? Your general health history from your GP. In my role, I need the equivalent of that, which is you know the, the last three to five years of tax returns mm -hmm. from the CPA. And a, you know, a typical client, we don't have a usual model. Mm -hmm. So I got out of the business of uh, giving free advice. You know, it was interesting. In my former career, when I was, you know, it was me on one side of the table and uh, the investment committee at whatever firm or, uh, you know, for whatever team on the other side of the table with an average age of 72 or 68. Uh, and then there's me, right? And we're talking about the yield curve steepener trade or the beta <laughs> bleed, right? Or, or some of these things. Right. And I thought, oh, I know. Uh, the typical potential client would love to know all of these things that I can talk about. The typical client doesn't want to know that. You go into that and they leave. The husband gets asked by the wife, what was, he, what was that guy talking about? Yep. I don't know, honey, it's just some economic stuff. Maybe we go to the guy down the street who uh, sent us that little invitation for a steak <laughs> dinner. It's something about guaranteed income in retirement, <laughs> right? <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and so really understanding the things that make the typical client tick and how to bring maximum value. Uh, much of that information is available on a tax return. Because let's say they're in the uh, highest tax bracket. What you do in a non-retirement, meaning a taxable portfolio, mm -hmm. read qualified dividends, can become much more important. Mm -hmm. Here's a common case. So someone will have a financial advisor or broker, whatever you want to call this person, and we'll meet. And our model is you're never going to get asked to move your money to us, ever. For a flat cost, we look at tax returns, estate planning documents, all insurance policies, and I mean all insurance policies, of course, investment accounts, and ultimately a household balance sheet if they have one. And it's our job to figure out where the planning gaps are. Mm -hmm. And in almost all cases, clients go, I have a great CPA. I have a great estate planner. I've been with my you know, advisor at two name firm or however many acronyms firm for years. And, you know, the trust company is going to take over when I transition to the spiritual side. And I go, okay, that's great. I've spent a lot of time in my life consulting these folks. Let me see what we might be able to determine. And at the end of that process, we give a full report with key findings. And in all but one case, every one of those folks has turned at the end of that and gone, I didn't know what I didn't know. You now know everything about me and mm -hmm. what needs to be done. What would you charge to manage the assets and just do all this stuff? And that was a model that took me three years to figure out, but that's really when the firm started to grow. So it's a holistic approach. Very much so. And I have to talk with the CPA. I have to talk with the estate planner. And to bring it back to answer the question. I bet the guy who's at the insurance company I don't, don't want to talk to you at all. <laughs> I'm not that popular among many of those folks. I would think right? not. But, but think about it. In medicine, licensed doctors have to take the Hippocratic Oath. That does not exist in our industry. No. That bothers me. No, first do no harm is it doesn't exist in, in your industry. It <laughs> right. sure as hell doesn't exist at the Fed. 
Right. You mean the Federal Reserve has not been the beacon of moral light? I mean, that was, that was something we talked about <laughs> constantly at the Fed, was mm. during the heat of the crisis, was first do no harm. Do you not understand that there's going to be consequences? I mean, Thomas Honig has been really vocal in the past six months or so in saying, you know, I was a lone voice mm. that dissented, dissented, dissented. And I remember at the time, I was like the main, I was like, go Tom, go. And, uh, you know, it's you know, hindsight, looking back, I, I just, Eric, I don't think central bankers appreciate how much they've monkeyed with economic cycles. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that they've really had an impact on is compressing the spread, in my opinion, in, in the corporate market, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. which, which may have, so, so what, I would, what I would concede is that directionally, the cycle still exerts a big influence mm -hmm. over where we're going. But when the cycle is, is moving higher, let's say, let's say we're in a cyclical upturn, their added liquidity provides an even additional compression, which causes things to get into these crazy valuations or, or sort of fuels the excesses that may have already been starting to build. It just comes in and it, and it blows things completely out of proportion. So define compression, define spread compression, please. Right. Okay, so, so the spread between uh, corporate bonds or, mm -hmm. or, or bonds that have, that have risk and, and treasury bonds. Right. So as that spread compresses, uh, and investors are looking for, for yield, it may force them to go further out on the risk spectrum or trade uh, bonds for equities or, or do something that they may have not otherwise have done right. if, those, if that availability for yield was a little bit higher. It also distorts some of the risk that we're seeing, right? So one thing that they, that they do, and this goes to how they may be adversely impacting everyday people, is you know, someone will say, well, I need yield. So I'm going to go buy this stock that has a 6% dividend yield or a 7% dividend yield mm -hmm. while the treasury rate is 2. And they're not putting together that, hey, if something is yielding three or four times the risk-free rate, that, that might mean that there's quite a bit of risk in there. But we're just, you know, the big, the big uh, one that I'm looking at, as you remember, in, in the early uh, 2010s was this big MLP. Uh, mm -hmm. Phenomenon. I mean, oh, yeah. there were there were huge yields attached to these MLPs that people rushed into, and then when the cycle turned, oil went down. Yep. They didn't end too well, but that may have been a phenomenon that the Fed created from from chasing yield. You know, if you look at the sector of the corporate bond market that has benefited the most in terms of borrowing costs post COVID, it is the triple B sector. Right. It is that rung right above junk. That credit rating right above junk. And oh, please, it's not junk. Let's call it high yield. yield. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Milken himself would call it right. junk. But Jay Powell said, you may not call it junk. And it's, it, 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 it's those kinds of events. When you see the marriage of hmm. the Fed and the Treasury and you get Treasury, it's, it's those kind of moments that make it that much more difficult to plan out portfolios. And because you, you have this artificial element that is kind of corroding the process. So I don't envy people like you. I just, I just advise people like you. So. And many of us are happy to listen and are devout followers of yours. <laughs> you know, we've talked a lot about passive versus active. And when it comes to the composition of a portfolio, I have a few thoughts to share. Mm -hmm. One is it's not either or, in my view, because data drives decisions, right? People go, well, I'm all passive or I'm all active. I go, why? First of all, it depends on the type of account. If it's a retirement account, meaning a qualified account, mm -hmm. then we're not taxed until we take money out, right? If it's a non-qualified or non-retirement account, the investment decisions that are made and the actions that are, are taken in that account really matter because yep. it's ultimately going to have an impact on that calendar year's tax return. So we will commonly have a family on board and they've had a financial advisor who may have put them into you know, expensive, very tax inefficient stock mutual funds in their non-retirement account. There's still a ton of money in active. People forget that. Yep. Like there's a ton of money in actively managed mutual funds. Yep. We all know the names of these companies, right? But they'll come on board and I have a software that will convert the average cost basis, which is how it's reported on the statement, to a tax lot specific cost basis. Let's go back over to the tax return. Is there any charitable intent? Is there any history of 
of philanthropic donations for a family. Well, if we have a tax lot that was sold to them in 1999, right? A, yep. A tech fund, right? Yep. And the appreciation on that particular tax lot is hundreds of percent or even more. We can use those positions to donate to charity through one or more vehicles, right? Let's get a tax deduction if they have that intent. Mm -hmm. And maybe, just maybe, because the capital gains and the dividends that are reinvested in these mutual funds, they might have tax lots that are at a loss. So we can go in and look at what tax lots are down short term, offset those with um, sales of short term tax lots that are up. So it's a net neutral from a tax standpoint. Same thing with long term loss uh, or long term gain long -term tax gains, lots, yeah. right? And when we look at the position or the, the composition, pardon me, of a portfolio, if passive for a particular market, large cap growth, I'm just coming up with, or with a, for a particular sector, historically has outperformed active and is cheaper and is more tax efficient, key driver there, tax efficient, then it doesn't matter what my opinions are with respect to active and passive. Mm -hmm. I like both, it just depends. Right. And that data drives how those uh, allocations are satisfied in a portfolio. All right, I'm gonna have to get you in touch with my CPA and others. <laughs> Um, I love nerding out with CPAs, big time. The typical CPA goes, you want tax returns? Why? And I go, because the, it's not that the tax tail should wag the financial planning or investment dog, but if the goal is to minimize unnecessary taxes. Yep. Let's say you have a million dollars in a non-retirement portfolio, meaning a taxable account, that's in all expensive tax inefficient mutual funds. Let's say you went to a two-name trust company who said, we'll manage the money for 50 basis points. By the way, we're gonna put it in our proprietary mutual funds. Yeah. Okay, with an with average huge fees. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. So let's look at the tax track. I look at the Schedule D on the tax return and I can see all of the, the, mm -hmm. the tax track that's showing up on that tax return. There are solutions for that and the public has no idea. Well, now they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's, let's go back to uh, a subject that has become such a hot issue on Twitter. And maybe if they don't hear it from Lacey Hunt, maybe if they hear it from somebody your age, they can finally understand that it is the growth of the money supply, not the stock of the money supply, that is the major determinant. Why right. is it so difficult to communicate this without getting you know, people hating me for like a 24 hour span. Right, I, I actually put on Twitter a, a couple days ago that I, I hadn't seen a lot of charts of money supply growth lately, right? It just, <laughs> when it's going the other direction, you know, um, we, we don't hear about it a lot. And then everyone, when, when money supply growth goes up, we call it printing money, but if the money supply growth starts to contract, are we gonna call it destroying money? I don't, I don't know, I don't think we are, right. but, um, but yeah, so it, it's the same concept as when we're looking at regular growth. A lot of people that I speak with uh, have a difficult time just understanding that the growth rate slowing is what's important, not um, is the growth rate good or is the growth rate bad? Because at the end of the day, that's an opinion, right? If I said to you, Danielle or Vance, economy X is growing at 5%, is that good or bad? You have no idea because yeah. if it grew, if it grew at ten percent the year before, it could be a national emergency, right? If it grew at at one percent, that would be the best growth rate the economy has ever seen. Same thing with the money supply, right? right? So if we had conditions that were created by forty percent money supply growth, and now we have ten percent money supply growth, you can't say, well, that's still a lot of money supply growth because it's relative to the conditions that were right. created at 40% money supply growth. So to your point, we're now seeing the money supply growth uh, decline pretty dramatically. And if the Fed is able to execute on these quantitative tightening plans that they mm -hmm. have outlined, we're likely to see an outright contraction in, in money supply growth. Yep. We're seeing a near contraction in the monetary base as of the last report. So that would be uh, radically different conditions than what were created over a year and a half ago. So. With all these things, it's the, it's the rate of change. You know, another example is, is you know, if you're going 100 miles an hour, is that fast or slow? Well, if it's a car, it might be fast. If it's an airplane, it might be slow. Right. Right. So it all depends on where you were coming from and where you're going. 
Yeah, the, the most animated that I heard Lacey get recently was he was he was like, have you seen the H8? And I'm like, no, sir. <laughs> yeah. I haven't please, seen the H8. Please tell me the H8. Have you seen other liabilities <laughs> yeah. and other deposits and liabilities? The growth rate slowed down to 2.2%. I'm like, I hear you. Amen. Yeah. But but people, I don't know why people just, they, they refuse to look at that. And so sticking on this, on this theme, 7.1% to a rounding error. I mean, if you look at where we were in terms of fourth quarter GDP and what's expected right now, and by the way, my former macroeconomic advisor, Ben Herzon, his, uh, he's got my favorite GDP model on the street. You know, he's down to, you know, to also a rounding error for the first quarter. That's one hell of a delta. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of the, the rate of change, that's a wicked slowdown. Yeah. And it's a wicked slowdown. I would have never said that, but I, I just yeah, repeated and it. All right. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's primarily coming from what we're, you know, to put it mildly, a, a collapse in real income, right? We keep seeing that the wages are the highest ever, and people are posting these numbers of Atlanta Fed wage trackers at six percent. It's the highest ever. They're yep. like, but well, we just got a nine percent or an eight percent inflation number, so real income's going in the wrong direction, right? And when when real income collapses then what happens to consumption, right? Consumption can't stay elevated if real income declines. And you know, we talk excess savings. That's, that's been the, the, the most uh, irritating the savings phrase. Cushion. The savings cushion. Yeah, th that one is really, to save the day. really driving me nuts. But you know, I don't know where all this excess savings has gone because the last report was 6.4% personal savings rate, the lowest yeah. since 2013, right? So as Lacey points out, this stimulus came and it went in, in record time. It, it seemed to fade uh, in, in a matter of quarters. And now here we are with negative real income growth, or soon to be, depending on what measure you use. Uh, retail sales coming out soon going to show uh, you know, growth rate in that you know, 1, 2, 3% range in real right. terms. Um, so now we're at a situation where, like you said, huge delta on the slowdown potential recessionary conditions where the Fed are now is, is now going to tighten. So that's going to create, a, it is creating a volatile cocktail, mm -hmm. and, and I would expect that to continue, especially as we walk closer and closer to this uh, recessionary window, which, which I outlined with, with several criteria. In, in, in my view, we're not, we're not quite there yet, but we could be there as the data comes in over the next couple of months. So what, um, what are these signposts? What are your red flags? So f first thing that I would look at is, is the growth rate declining or is the growth rate accelerating? If the growth rate is accelerating, you can't be going into a recession, right? That is true. So that's, that's sign number one. Is the growth rate declining? Absolutely yes, right? And then is the growth rate sufficiently close to zero, right? Because if we had a massive economic shock a year ago where the growth rate in the economy was 7%, you can't put the economy in a recession because the shock would have had to knock 700 basis points off of growth. It would have had to have been, you know, like a nuclear bomb or something like that, or a COVID lockdown, something like that, right? Right, right. right. But but barring but barring that, there's no, you know, uh, an oil price spike at 7% real growth won't cause a recession, right? So the growth rate has to be sufficiently close to zero, at which point a shock can can knock a couple hundred basis points off and tip you negative. So is the growth rate sufficiently close to zero? We're getting pretty close to zero, mm -hmm. right? And then the third condition that I look at is at least one of my four coincident indicators has to have negative growth. And coincident, I mean income, consumption, employment, or production, right? Yep. Industrial production is not quite negative yet. Mm -hmm. Employment growth is, is declining, but still at about 4%. Consumption growth has fallen to about 2%, so it's not quite zero. And then real income, is real income negative? It, it, it is about to be, depending on which measure you're right. using, right? And I think I, I would argue that discretionary <laughs> consumption is, is probably slowing at a faster pace than exactly because, right. of, because of essentials inflation. Exactly right. My friend Torsten Slock at Apollo, I think you met Torsten recently, yeah. but my friend Torsten Slock at Apollo said that when you add up uh, food, energy, and utilities costs pre-Ukraine, that that was absorbing 50% of your lowest income quintiles after-tax income. I mean, that's a massive number. Massive. And, and it shows in the consumer sentiment numbers, University of Michigan mm -hmm. consumer sentiment numbers, which are plunging to levels that are quite consistent with recession. I'm always very cautious to throw the recessionary flag because you hate to be labeled one of these right, people right, right. that's throwing recession around lightly. And it's not to be thrown out lightly, which is why I try and map out criteria which give us a 
really good indication that we are at recession's door right now. All you need is a shock. Mm -hmm. And are we there yet? As of the data in hand, not quite. Yep. But if the next couple reports come in as we think they are with this recent uh, inflation spike from Russia, Ukraine, we will be there. So then all you need is a shock to tip the scales. Well, two shocks that are pretty historically uh, common for causing recessions are Fed over tightening and oil price spikes, right? Those are two very common shocks. So and we got both. And we have potentially. And a yield curve that with, is. With a 210 spread of 25 basis it, points. Exactly, right? before the first hike. Right. Right, so, so that cocktail there is, is uh, something that would, would cause uh, me to say it's, it's a good time to, to manage your risk. And, and that's ultimately what I try and do. I try and help people manage their risk around these cyclical inflection points. So a question for both of you. I'm, I'm curious, because um, Vance, you're going to have an opinion regardless, because you're as fed up as I am. Um, we're in a midterm election year. Oh, boy. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask anything terrible. We don't have to like spend the next 30 minutes talking about Elizabeth Warren. What fun would that be? Um, can the Fed go at it alone? If something happens to the markets, if something happens to the economy, and I'm, 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 I'm asking both of you the same question, can the Fed go at it alone? Because in a post-COVID world, the answer was no. Post-financial post crisis, the answer was yes. They were able to, to bring the economy back from the brink all by themselves. My view, and it's just an opinion, because unlike you, I can't have, um, I can't come out publicly with, this is what I fundamentally believe, just given my role in the industry and the compliance alligators, as I like to call them. I suspect that the Fed will very cautiously, very slowly try to get us from 0.25% to maybe 2.5% with a hat tip to 2018. Remember the two year was at three, the Fed funds rate got to 2.5. What happened? Equity markets in Q4 crumbled. Steve Mnuchin, our Lord and Savior, came out on the Sunday before Christmas and said, don't worry, I've talked to the six largest, largest banks. banks. They're all well capitalized. <laughs> I wasn't worried, Steve. Do I have something I need to worry? Like, remember, I and tell clients. why are you telling this from a from right, full side right. of Cabo? What's the timing? Like, you know, you know, I fly a ton. Yeah. That's like a pilot at a cruising altitude of 37,000 feet, clear blue skies, getting on going, uh, well, folks, uh, beautiful day out there. I'm really good at crash landings, but you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right? Right. right. So, you know, you and I know some very smart people who are of the mindset that the Fed is going to have to hike regardless. Could the Fed hike us into recession? Anything's possible. I still like to believe that rainbows, butterflies, and unicorns can still exist in harmony, right? <laughs> but um, cue in, the music. In a, in a mid uh, midterm know, in election a, year. Midterm election year, is the Fed going to take the political risk of doing that? Fast forward two years, what is this administration going to want to have uh, in, in its arsenal when it's up for election, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and I'm not in the business of making prognostications. Um, anything is possible. You know, you mentioned um, some of these, these fat tail events, right? Um, anything is possible. Eric, after what we've witnessed yeah. with the biggest stimulus <laughs> injection into the U.S. economy that eclipsed that of the New Deal of 1940, yeah. can the Fed go at it alone? So it, it depends on what, on what the objective is, right? If Preventing a meltdown. I think that the, so I don't think that the Fed can really go at this alone, but that doesn't mean that marrying the Fed and the Treasury is going to yield good results, right? So. Uh, can the Federal Reserve at this point do anything to help the real economy? No. And I think that we all know that the answer to that question over the last 10 or 15 years has been no, right? There's been heavy-handed central banks around the world, and we've produced some of the worst real growth rates that we've seen in, in decades, right? So can the Fed go at it alone and help the real economy? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Can the Fed go at it alone and help asset markets? Potentially, right? But they couldn't do it during the COVID. They needed help from the Treasury in terms of these special purpose vehicles. Right. Right. So, which Pat Toomey has said are not allowed are, are, to be turned are not back allowed on. anymore. They right. Are, they are. So, so the, that is the switches off, Janet. That is interesting. So, um, but 
If you do have the Fed and the Treasury, let's say they don't do special purpose vehicles, but they do a combination of easier monetary policy with stimulus, which is what most people think that they'll do at the first sign of, of, uh, of a problem. Uh, yeah, I do think that it'll create another short-term pop, but we're seeing right now what the uh, aftermath or what the long-term effects of these heavy-handed government policies are, whether it's from the Federal Reserve or the Treasury, in terms of high inflation, and lower real income. Real income is not any higher than it was before COVID on February of 2020. Gosh, so that is so did they help us at all? Did they end up, help, were, were these policies helpful? When you, know, when, when, uh, when you look at the full sample, which usually takes, in, in, in my view, in my work, about three years of any of these government policies to show what the what the full effect was, right? We can't we can't look at the stimulus and then look at the next quarter's growth, right? Because of course, if they send you a check today, you're going to spend it, right? Yeah. But what was the impact of that? It was a, a damaged supply chain, higher inflation, lower real income. These problems manifest over time, mm -hmm. and when you look at the full three-year sample, I don't think that these policies are ultimately helpful. So I don't think that they can go out alone, but even if they do go out with the Treasury, I'm not sure it'll be any helpful to the real economy. Well, from somebody who's watched corporate debt go from 10 trillion to 12 trillion outstanding in a post-COVID world, I'll, I'll never forget that timestamp. February the 19th, 2020, I see this headline that said, US corporate debt market surpasses 10 trillion mi milestone. And now $2 trillion later, balance sheets aren't any healthier. There's been a lot of equity issued. Right. So, Generally speaking, we, we don't have a healthier corporate bond market. And I learned about that from Jeremy Stein, who started at the Fed with Jay Powell. And he's like, you can only monkey with the corporate debt market so much before something's going to break. Right. And I would argue that I would argue that this Fed, because it's so hawkish, the voting members in 2022, mm -hmm. I would argue that, that this Fed's prepared to put the U.S. economy into recession. It, it may be their only choice if their goal is to bring down Inflation, because if inflation is related to the supply chain and the supply chains are not getting any better before the election, let's say. Let's say that's their goal, to bring down inflation before the mm -hmm. election. Well, if the supply side is permanently crimped, sort of your only option is to stunt demand, mm -hmm. right? So this is a box like I've never seen before in terms of uh, what I would really not be envious of is, is what happens if these... Uh, GDP numbers or real growth numbers come down even further, and then it leads to uh, job losses, right. right? Because now we're talking about an ultimate, like a, a legitimate box against their mandate, right? Because their mandate's employment and price stability. So mm -hmm. what do you do if the inflation rate is still 6 or 7% and you have one or two NFP numbers that are minus 100? Yep. Now what? That's a game changer. That's a game changer. And then if you, if you are of the opinion that the Fed likes to uh, communicate with the with the White House on policy, which is which is preferable, job cuts and job losses or higher inflation. What do you pick? It's a very difficult situation that we're in, and I don't think that the Fed has an well. Easy I mean, way out. It, it, it's a unique backdrop to see politicians saying the Fed needs to tighten policy. I'm like <laughs> going back in my history books. I'm like, I don't remember politicians exactly. saying that. Right. And, and what's interesting, from from the lens that I look at, the, the manifestation of this massive sort of irreparable box is a twos tens curve that's 25 basis points before the first hike. Well, I think the bond market is very, uh, is, is picking up on the fact that this is a sort of a very treacherous situation and I'm not sure if the bond market's convinced that they can weasel their way out of it. No, I, I, I think you're right. Um, and no, I don't think the Fed has ever done this much damage to itself or been, by the way, as politicized as it is. Right. I mean, you still have all these empty seats. I mean, it's just remarkable. Right. Um, Vance, let's just say some of our younger viewers are watching today, and that sounded like the biggest cliche of all time. Uh, what do you tell people who are at the beginning of their investing life cycle? If somebody's like, Mr. Bars, how do I, how do I get started? What, what's the first thing that you recommend that I do? Research. Research. Research, 100%. Understand where we are in this cycle, which specific cycle it is, the, the difference between macro and micro, understand you know, ultimately what is their investment objective. I hear a lot of people reach out to me and do a lot of mentorship, and I'm not very public about that. 
I've been very fortunate to have some mentors in my career and we all hit a certain point in our lives where we want to give back, where we want to mm -hmm. carry that baton, right? Yep. The world is still full of good despite you know all of these things <laughs> that, that we've discussed and all the potential concerns on the horizon. But you know, I, I really, when they ask, you know, what do I buy? I really identify what is it ultimately that they want. Mm -hmm. Is it the hot stock? Because you know what, I'm not on CNBC and I'm not yeah. Jim Cramer, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm sorry, <laughs> right? But um, you know, it, is what type of account is it? What's the time horizon and so forth? And um, maybe save, learn how to save. Oh. Let me ask, why are we not teaching financial literacy in this country? Why is that not part of the core curriculum? Like, seriously, it, it just boggles my mind. Because you actually jumped to step two. I'm trying to get younger people to understand right. that they need to save. Yeah. They need to save in the first place. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, it's such an important point. I, I read a report that um, the amount of money that you have at retirement is uh, determined 75% by your savings rate. The second factor was not even rate of return. It was what you do, I think, which is asset allocation, right? right? The rate of return that you get on your investments, whether it's 5% or 8%, is a lot less important than how much you're able to earn and how much you're able to save yep. out of that income. So I feel like most people spend 99% of their time focused on the rate of return and such a small percentage of the time on one saving and then two what's my overall asset allocation strategy what's my plan and then i can play around the edges of that plan and try and enhance the rate of return sure. uh, you know maybe manage these cycles but within the context of a, a broader asset allocation plan and a high savings rate 100 yeah, percent, and coming up with an actual plan right so if this was triage what are our immediate cost needs. Are we saving for a house? Are we saving for retirement? Yep. So many of these folks reach out and they're like, oh, I just I want as much money as possible. You're what like, are your for what? what are your goals? Exactly. Right? And what's the time frame here? And so coming up with different yeah. pockets um, you know, for specific purposes is important. Eric, um, recommended reading if somebody wants to get started to just begin to understand the basics of your world. So it's not gonna put somebody young to sleep? Yeah, so uh, I'll actually start with, with a book that Lacey Hunt recommended to me as a starting point, which was uh, Milton and Rose Friedman, Free to Choose. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, yeah. important, a really important book because um, it, it explains the, the changing incentives that happen when the government steps in, whether it's the Federal Reserve or uh, the, the federal government, and how that changes incentives. And it just gives a very high-level overview of how economies work, how incentives work, what moves the world forward, what doesn't move the world forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and beyond that, I would, I would read anything on, on demographics and demographic forecasts, because if yep. there's one thing that, you, that you, it's important to understand would be, would Dem be demographics. Demographics is destiny. Yeah. Um, okay, so I just, can we, can we possibly, a, a, as a parting gift to all the viewers, can you, what's the deal with these socks, guys? <laughs> so, for me, these socks are, are dachshunds. I, at home, I have a four-year-old wire hair dachshund uh, who's the cutest guy you'll ever see. So, in honor of him today, for, for good luck, I, I wore okay, some dachshunds. Okay, they rock. Socks. Yeah. You and know, it's you're... so funny you mention that because normally the socks that I wear are either socks with my daughter's face or my son's face. We have two very young children yeah. as late blooming parents. And Joey they're and very I. cute. And well, they take after mom, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but you know, we live in a, in a world where things are very serious and this industry can be so You're wearing serious. bespoke so, socks. Yeah, you know, it's, there's, um, it just adds a little uh, personality. Well, look guys, I've never talked about socks on Down the Middle. <laughs> Um, but that goes to show you that I need to have more young people on who actually think about what, well, women always think about what we put on our feet, <laughs> but men as well. Uh, I want to thank both of you. This was so different and unique, and I hope the viewers enjoy it. And let's do this again sometime. Thank you. Please. Such an honor. Yes, and thank you so much for having us Thanks, on. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'm not as old as you thought, right? I brought in some people who are actually hip onto the show. So um, give me a big thumbs up. And, uh, and you know, on the theme that they both agreed on, Vance and Eric, demographics is destiny. 
If you want the ultimate primer, go back to the Down the Middle where I interviewed Dennis McGill of Zelman and & Associates and, and learn about where we are in the long cycle of U.S. demographics that does not just touch on the older generations, but indeed your age, much younger generations and declining population growth in that cohort as well. Until next time, I appreciate your time. This is Danielle DiMartino Booth with Down the Middle. Thank you.